Hello, welcome to Numeristical. We are now in our 12th video on baseball prediction. So in the last video, we decided to pivot a little bit and start focusing on, can we build a model for the number of runs scored given the hitting statistics of one team and the pitching statistics of the other team? And we wanted to predict a distribution. We want to get probabilities, probability of zero runs, probability of one runs, and so forth. And so we did that. We did that using the Corsage algorithm, which uh, uses gradient boosting to predict distributions. So we showed how that worked. And now in this video, we are going to put together the run distribution prediction for each of the two teams in a game. So you've got one set of hitters versus the other set of pitchers, and then the reverse. We're going to put those two together and come up with a distribution on the total number of runs scored for the game. And then given the over-under, we can start uh, putting probabilities on whether we think it's going to go over, under, or a push. So uh, before we get into things, I'd like to make a few announcements. So the first announcement is that I've made some bug fixes to the structure boost package. So if you're running into some problems before, a few people left some notes in the comments that they're running into some problems. I think I fixed it with the latest version. So make sure you upgrade to the latest version of Structure Boost uh, going forward. And everything should hopefully work soon. If it doesn't, please leave me a comment or contact me. Let me know. The second is that uh, I've launched a private Discord channel for people to discuss some of these topics if you want to go a little bit more in depth or to ask some more detailed questions. So uh, I will leave an invite to that Discord channel in the description. Now, the invite's only going to be good for seven days. So if you were trying to join and it, that invite no longer works, just leave me a comment or contact me and I'll refresh the invite. Um, but I hope people do join. I, I think it's a great place to discuss and, and get more, more deeply into some of these topics. And the final announcement is, as always, if you could please like this video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps me out a lot, especially if you're uh, a consistent viewer. This way you can know when the next video comes out and stay, stay on top of things as, as we go forward. And with that said, let's move to the notebook. Okay, so to reiterate, last time we built a model to predict the runs run scored given the features about the hitting team and the opposing pitchers. So we basically broke a game up into two, two separate sections, one where the home team is batting against the visiting pitchers and another where the visiting team is batting against the home pitchers. And we came up with a model for predicting the runs scored. And we came up, we used this corsage, this probabilistic regression approach to predict full distributions. So for any number of runs, we have the probability that it's going to be a shutout, probability of exactly one run, probability of exactly two runs, given a set of hitters and a set of pitchers. So now we want to predict the over-under. So for each game, we're going to take the two distributions of runs scored that we have for that game and come up with a distribution on the total number of runs scored. And we're going to use that to make predictions about the over-under. Now, this is the, our first attempt to do this. We're just going to use an independence assumption. So we're basically going to say, you know, one team does their batting against the pitching. They score whatever runs they score. And the number of runs that the other team gets against the other pitchers is completely independent. Now, that's probably not true in practice, right? Because, for example, if a game's a blowout, if you score 10 runs early, you might put in uh, a rookie pitcher or like a, one of your weaker pitchers because you've got a big lead. You're not going to, you're going to save your best relievers for another day. And so that might mean that the other team is more likely to score more runs. Um, likewise, if a game is very close, you, you might use some strategies to just try to score one more run rather than going for a big inning. So things like a sacrifice bunt in the ninth inning, for example. So this independent assumption is likely not true in practice, but it's probably close enough to give reasonable predictions. And we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later on as we get to that part. But we're going to use this independence assumption. This will enable us to take a first crack at giving probabilities on over, under, or push. And then we're actually going to evaluate how this model would have fared in practice if we'd made bets on it and try to do some analysis to see, like, can, could we really make money with this model? So let's jump into it. So. Uh, Again, upgrade to the latest version of Structure Boost. You should be at version 0 0.4.1 or, or later. Um, so make sure, make sure you've upgraded if you haven't. 
we're going to import these packages. I'm using SciPy a little bit too, so if, if people don't have that installed, make sure you import, uh, install SciPy. Um, again, let's check our version. We're on version 0.4.1. And now we're going to load in our data. Okay, so we're downloading in data. Um, now again, if you remember, we decided we wanted to sort of put an upper limit on the number of runs that we wanted to consider. So basically pick some number and say, if you score this much or more, we're just going to call that one category. So before, I made one little modification from last time. So the highest over underline we had was 15 before. And so last time I said, okay, that means we only have to go up to 15. If you think about it more deeply, there's actually, you know, some slight corner cases where you, you might be important to go up to 16. So I'm making one small modification, very minor, but I'm actually going to go up to 16. So there's going to be 17 different possibilities for our target variable. 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 16. And 16 means 16 or higher. And otherwise, we're going to use the same thing. We're going to, uh, again, use 1981 through 2018 as our training set. Uh, 19, 2019 and 2020 as our validation set, and 2021 as our test set. Um, and we're going to take from our initial data frame, we're going to create this DF test, which is just will give us the over-unders corresponding to these games. So remember, these three are from our DF runs. So this was the data frame we created last lesson, where we basically broke each game into two sections. So we've got twice as many rows in this in this data frame. And this is from our initial data frame where we still have the over under values. So again, we can look at the, the we can look at the uh, the top of this DF runs table. This is all the same as last time. I'm gonna use the same feature sets as last time. Again, the only thing I changed was now we're going up to 16 plus instead of to 15 plus. I'm gonna build that same model that I built last time. So we're gonna let that run. Okay, so we're done running, and uh, you know, it took about 12 minutes or so. And now we're going to make our predictions. So this should all be pretty much the same as we had before. Um, and again, we can look at these, these distributions of the first few things in our test set, and you can see how these have you know, different shapes depending on, on which pair of uh, hitting and pitching teams we've got. So now we've got this, these distributions. We want to predict the over-under. And as we discussed before, we're going to model the total score as an independent sum of the two scores. So we're almost going to treat the game like the hitters go against the pitchers and they bat their nine innings and they get their runs. And then completely separately, the hitters, the other team's hitters bat against the other team's pitchers and they get their whatever they're going to score in nine innings and then we add them together that's essentially going to be our model so we're going to come up with a little function that given these two probability distributions and given a value for the over under it's going to return the probability of going over go being under or being a push and uh I won't spend too much time going through this, but just to sort of show how this works. First, we basically round, the, this is the over under value. So we round it up and we round it down. And that's just a quick way to check if it's, um, if it's a integer value or if it's a 0.5, right? Because um, for the over under, sometimes they might say the over under is 11.5. And so that means if, if it's 11 or less, it's under. If it's 12 or higher, it's under. And there's no chance of a push. But sometimes they'll put the over-under at, let's say, 10. And that means that if it's 9 or nine or lower, it's the under. If it's 11 or higher, it's the over. And if it's a 10, it's a push. And everybody just gets their money back. So we got to treat these two things a little bit separately. We have to be a little bit careful. But essentially, the way this is going to work is for the second distribution, we're going to get the cumulative density function, so the probability that you're less than or equal to a particular value. And then when we have a decimal value, so let's say val is 11.5, so that means val down is 11 and val up is 12, so this is, we're going to go into this part of the code. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to go from 0 to 11. Now remember with Python you got to put this plus 1 in the range, 
but this is going to go from zero to val down inclusive. And we're going to say, okay, you've got the probability that you're under is the probability that team A scored this many runs, I, and team B scored less than or equal to val down minus I, so that the total is less than or equal to, uh, to val down. <clears throat> so this is just a simple way to basically iterate through and count up all the different combinations that add up to a number less than or equal to val down. And once you do that, in, in this section, if it's a decimal value, it's a little easier because you know there's no push. So it's, if it's not uh, the under, then it's definitely going to be the over. Um, otherwise, let's say we have an integer value. We have to be a little bit more careful. So we're going to, again, let's say, let's say val is 11. That means we're going to go from val down is 11. So then we're going to go from 0 to 10. The probability of under is going to be all the ways we could add up to 10 or less. And then for we're also going to count up what happens if we're exactly 10 and those are going to be pushes now i made one slight adjustment and you can actually turn this off and that's this thing called ties go over so i made this one little modeling assumption that says let's say your over under is 10 and the model predicts it's going to be 5 5. what i'm going to the way i decided to interpret that is to say well if it's 5 5 it's going to go into extra innings somebody's going to score so it's going to be the over so in this sort of corner case where you've got an integer value for the over under line and it's an even number and the model predicts exactly a tie i'm going to let that go to the over and if you want to if you don't want it to do that if you want it to count as a push you could just set this to false again this is a pretty minor corner case i don't think it has a huge influence on on our big picture statistics of, of how all this works, but it was just something I thought through. So let's let that go. Define that function. Now here I'm just going to count up how many games we have. And this is just um, this is just a way of how do we put back together uh, and match up from DF runs. So remember, we have this runs table where we separate each game into two different rows. And so now I'm going to need to put those back together. And I'm going to do that this way. Because what this line does is this is going to give us our over under probability. So the probability of over, probability of under, probability of push for each game in our test set. Now remember, this is the game level test set as opposed to the team level DF runs data frame that we built the model on. So we've got two different data frames. One has twice as many rows as the other because we broke up each game into two different aspects for the two different hitting teams. Now we're essentially going to put those back together. And the way we're going to put that back together is we're going to go through how many games did we have before we broke it up. And we're going to say, okay, the, the i throw of our DF runs test goes with the I plus none game, num games test row. So essentially, if there were, let's say there were 100 games, so we would have 200 rows of our table. And so row 0 and row 100 would match up together to form the game. And row 1 and 101 would match up together to form a game, and so forth. So this is just data manipulation. But um, what we're doing here is putting, putting things back together so that we can take the two separate predictions of runs scored and put them together, grab the over underline for that game, and come up with our prediction. So let's let this run. And let's just look around. So we've got now, let me just do one quick thing, which is just look at P props. I'm going to look at like the first five rows of this just to show you, so you can all get a sense of what it looks like. So for the, what this means is for the first five games, the first game it said over 67%, under 33%, and 0% for a push. So this probably had a decimal line. And then the second game said 42%, 42.3% for the over, 47.7% for the under, and almost 10% for a push, and so forth. So this is what this OUP probs matrix looks like. If I take the means 
this just says overall the average prediction of the model across all the games in our test set was 44.7 percent of the time it predicted over 51.1 percent time it predicted under and four percent of the time it picked a push and let's look at what the actual over under results were for that same test set and you see that um, the over so i have over under probability okay sorry just realized i didn't have my cursor showing so i might have been pointing at some things that you didn't see but um the way i've got the oup probabilities matrix set up is that the first number is the over second number is the under third number is the push so you can see in the actual data set the over was 46.6 percent the under was 48.5 percent so in in this test set the under did happen a little bit more than the over and our model is predicting that even even to sort of a bigger extreme so that's something to keep in mind that uh the, the over and under were not equally likely in the test set. They were off by about 2%, not a huge difference, but just something to keep, to keep in mind as we evaluate this. Now, again, to just get a sense of our predictions, let's look at what was, let's do histograms of the over probabilities. So that's the zeroth column, the under probabilities, which is the oneth column, and the, the pushes, which are the second column. Let's look at those histograms. So first, let's focus on the over and the under. So the over, you see that it's predicting the under more frequently than the over. We saw that in the summary statistics. So on, on average, the under probability is over here. It's like 0 0.45, 0.44, 0.45, something like that. Whereas the over is more around 0.5. And you see that over here, we got a pretty thick tail for the under. Uh, so it's you're very likely to have a high probability for the under. You're a little bit less likely to have a high probability for the over. And for whatever reason, I don't really know what's going on here. There is a little bit of a bias in the test set, and that in the in the reality of this test set, we did have more overs than unders. Um, and then if you look at the pushes, this kind of makes sense. So this bar of zero is the games where uh, you had a decimal over underline so we know the probability of a push was a zero and here's the distribution of the pushes when you had an even number and you see when there is a a, a decimal uh, or an integer line so when a push is possible on average it happens about 10 percent right so pushes happen about i think it was like four four and a half percent of the time but half the games are not possible roughly so then when it is possible it's like nine percent or something like that so let's just, again, sanity check on our model, see if things seem reasonable. So, you know, it's a little, um, it's a little interesting that we're predicting the under a lot more than we're predicting the over. That is happening to some degree in the data, so I'm not too concerned about that. Um, but anyway, so now we've got a model and we've got predictions. So for every game now, I've got a prediction of the over, the under, and a push. So let's let's try to see what would happen if we bet using this model. So let's say we developed this on the train set and we went ahead and we made bets using this model. Now what are we going to do? We're not going to bet on everything, right? We're only going to bet kind of some, somewhere out in these tails here. Somewhere where the, uh, because Again, with the Vegas line, now I don't have the specific lines on these, but the typical line for an over-under is like negative 110. So they usually try to they try to make the over-under so that's about a 50-50 bet, and then they take their edge. And the typical edge they'll take is they'll require a minus 110 bet, which means if you bet and lose, you lose $11. If you win, you only get $10. So that's where they take their edge from. So we'd only want to bet when we have a lot of confidence that we're going to win. So we'd want to be sort of over 50%, but we have to be careful because there's these pushes also, right? So in the push, we just get our money back. So there's a few ways to think about how to, how to examine the edge. We want to bet when we have an edge. 
And the way I'm going to define having an edge is I'm going to take out the push probability and I'm going to say the probability of, if the probability of being under over the probability of being over or under. So basically the conditional, given that it's not a push, what's the probability that the, the under will win? And if, if it's more than 0.5 plus whatever edge I want to build in for myself to make, be confident making the bet, then I'm going to bet on the under. And uh, likewise for the over. If the probability of being over conditioned on not being a push is more than 0.5 plus some edge, I'm going to bet on the over. So this is a little function I just wrote to say how well would I have done on this test set if I use these probabilities and only bet where I had an edge of this much. And the way this function works is I say, I figure out which, which games I would have bet on, uh, count them up, see how many I got right, how many did I get right of the unders, how many did I push of the unders, how many did I get right of the overs, how many did I push of the overs. From that I can get the total that I got, bets I won, bets I pushed, bets I lost, also get the percentages, and then I just print all of this out. And then I also say, okay, assuming that I was betting at this negative 110 line, how much money would I have made or lost? So again, it's just a simple calculation, just evaluating, adding through, saying, assuming I bet at a certain threshold of confidence, how much money would I make? And now I'm going to run through and I'm going to run this function for starting in, for an edge of 0.25, edge of 0.2, all the way down to just an edge of 0.05 and see how I would have done. When my threshold was 0.25, so that means I only bet when I thought there was like throwing out pushes a 75% chance of winning. There were 78 games that I bet on, 71 unders, only seven overs. And I was right 40, uh, right 45 of those 78, 57.7% of the time. I was wrong only 38% of the time. And there were three pushes. And if I was betting, again, factoring in that Vegas is taking this big, that they're, I'm not getting a fair bet, um, I would have made 15% per bet, so I would have made a total profit of 12 across all 78 bets. So that that looks pretty promising. It's a pretty small sample size, but um, for the games I was very confident. Now notice it, it's not 75 here and 25 here, right? Like it's if, if the model was totally right, we would expect this number to be uh, three times as big as this number, and it's clearly not. So we don't have as much of an edge as we think we do. Um, but we are, we are making money on those bets, it looks like. And we're going to do some deeper analysis uh, later on to show, you know, do I really believe this? Do I really believe this edge? Could this be chance and so forth? But let's go down. Let's say I, this is very restrictive. I'm only betting on 78 games out of, you know, 9,000 or so. So what if I lowered the threshold and said I don't need as much of an edge? Well, I could lower the threshold to 0.2, and then I would have bet on 179 games, would have won 96, lost 76 with seven pushes. So I would have won 53.6% of the time, lost 42.5% of the time, and pushed 4% of the time. And I would have made less per bet, but I would have made a bigger profit across all the bets. Only by a little bit, though. Um, so let's lower the threshold a little more. Now I've got 355 games. Again, a lot more unders than overs. Uh, and I would have been right 182 times, wrong 155 times. And uh, again, would have made a profit of less per bet and about the same across all the bets. So notice that even though I'm winning, on all of these, my profit is not that much. And that's because, again, Vegas is taking this edge. That edge cuts pretty significantly into your profit. 
Now, threshold of, um, this is 0.1. Uh, you can see now already I'm getting my, my, my edge is already, Vegas is already overcoming my edge. So I won 489 times. I lost 458 times. So I'm, I'm doing better than 50-50, but not good enough to beat Vegas. Vegas is vigorous. So I'm actually losing money, even though I'm right more than half the time. So it shows you the power of, of Vegas's edge. You have to be really confident and, and have a really big edge to be able to make money compared to Vegas's edge. And then you see again, if I only bet on things where there's a very small edge, um, again, I'm still ahead, but, but not by much and not by enough. And I start really losing money because even though, again, I'm winning more than I'm losing, but because of Vegas's edge in the vigorous, I'm, I'm gonna lose money overall on average, right? So this is interesting, right? So, so it does look though, right? Like I have an edge. I mean, all of these I'm winning more than I'm losing. And these are presumably sort of 50-50 bets. And even with a small edge, I'm winning more than I'm losing. But now let's do some evaluation to get a sense of, could, could this be luck? Could it just be like this was a lucky flip of the coins? And the way I'm gonna try to evaluate that is using a likelihood ratio. So I wrote this little function that says, given the number I got right and the number I got wrong, and using a null probability, so the null hypothesis is like, I'm flipping coins, this model doesn't tell me anything, everything's a coin flip, so everything's 50-50. And then using an alternative probability, let's compare what's the likelihood if I actually have an edge. And we're gonna say, what's the likelihood of seeing this data under the null hypothesis? What's the likelihood of seeing this data, data under this specific, so I'm gonna pick a specific alternative hypothesis and evaluate that. And then I'm gonna say, how much more likely is the data under the alternative hypothesis versus the null hypothesis. So first I'm gonna do it for uh, the numbers we had for the threshold of 0.25. So I'm gonna throw out the pushes and I'm gonna say, okay, I got 40, there were basically 75 coin flips, 45 were I got right, 30 I got wrong. The null hypothesis that this is just a coin flip and the alternative hypothesis is, no, I actually have an edge and I'm gonna set the edge here to be exactly the, the probability I achieved. So you could quibble with this a little bit, but let's just, this is again, just trying to get a sense, we're just trying to get a sense of like, could this be luck? Or is it like very unlikely to be luck? So I'm gonna look at this likelihood ratio and I've got to run the function, so I gotta do it again. And we get 4.5. So this says that um, this observation is four and a half times more likely to happen under the alternative hypothesis than the null hypothesis. Um, now, because of the way I set this up, this is always going to be bigger than one because I'm using the best possible probability here and I'm using 0.5 here. So there's a little bit of a, a favoritism baked into this that way. But, but one way to think about this, if you're used to think about p-values, this is kind of saying like, um, if this was nine, this would roughly be like a p-value of 0.1 because a p-value of 0.1 says there's only a 10% chance of seeing this under the null hypothesis. And what a ratio of, of nine here would say would be something like, this is nine times more likely under the alternative hypothesis than under the null hypothesis. So if you kind of came in saying, I think it's a 50-50 chance that uh, you're beating Vegas versus Vegas, you know, versus you're just, your model is just flipping coins, um, then I would kind of be 90% sure after seeing this data that you're, uh, that the model is, is doing something. So again, this is just to get, get a sense of like, you know, how unusual would it be to, to get so many more right than wrong if I really, this model was really just doing nothing. If it was just like flipping coins, you know, the model would just have no predictive power whatsoever. So this is saying, it, it's, it's, this is four and a half times more likely 
to occur when you've got this probability of success than when you've just when you're just flipping coins. And I could do this for the other thresholds too. And you see it goes down as I start getting uh, start betting more. It's actually less confident that I have an edge. And so there, there's two things going on, right? One is that um, if you have a big edge, right? If I, if I took this, let's take this one. And let's say instead of 45 and 30, it was 450 and 300. Now I'd have a really big likelihood ratio, right? So this is tremendous, right? This is very, very, very strong evidence that I'm not flipping coins because it's 450 versus 300. It'd be very unlikely to flip a coin 750 times and get this much of an edge. But since I only flipped it 75 times, it could happen, right? I could just have happened to get a, a, a bad roll of the dice. So as you get more data, your, your likelihood ratio is going to uh, get bigger for the same edge. But, um, but as in this case, as we're getting more, as we're betting on more games, our edge is also getting less and our, our, so we're, we're only getting a few more right than we are wrong. So it's actually saying, hey, you know, this could be that you have an edge, but it also could just be that you're, uh, that you're, you're flipping coins and got a lucky flip of the coins. So, you know, these likelihood ratios are not quite where I would want them to be to feel confident. I would start, once we start getting to like 10, 20, these are numbers where I start feeling like, okay, we're, I'm quite certain we're doing better than 50-50. At these numbers, it's it's some evidence. I feel like we're probably onto something, but not super confident, not super duper confident. I'd like to be more convinced. So in conclusion, looks promising. Looks like our model could beat Vegas in the long run, but I'd like to see some higher likelihood ratios to have a little bit more confidence. So what we're going to do in the next video is we're going to repeat this notebook with more test data take a little bit out of our training data. We've got actually four years of odds data. So let's try to make our test set bigger and see if we can get some more convincing evidence that we are actually sort of beating Vegas, that we actually do have some edge here. So that's going to be in our next video. So again, thank you very much for joining. In the next video, we're going to just go through this again. We're going to see if we can, can demonstrate with a bigger test set more convincing evidence that we've got an edge here. And then we're also going to do some analysis about, okay, if we have the edge we think we have, how much money do we expect to make? And, and what's the probability, what's, what does that range of possibilities look like? Uh, for example, like, could I still lose money? If I, if I have an edge and I bet on a certain number of games, what's the probability I'll still just lose money because I just, I just got unlucky. So we're going to analyze all that in the next video. Um, again, before closing, I'd like to ask you again, if you could please like this video and subscribe to the channel, it helps me out a ton. And, uh, with that said, have a great day. The, the next video where I do that, uh, should come out very shortly. So have a great day.